Moving on to ships and vehicles. Here we go, we got a lot to go through. So, FTL drive. Faster than light drives use element zero cores to reduce the mass of the ship, allowing higher rates of acceleration. Uh, acceleration. This effectively raises the speed of flight. Sorry. This effectively raises the speed of light within the mass effect field, allowing high speed travel with negligible relativistic time dilatation effects. <laughs> wow, okay. That's a mouthful. Starships will require conventional thrusters, chemical rockets, commercial fusion torch, economy ion engine, or military anti proton drive, in addition to the FTL drive core. With only a core, a ship has no motive power. The amount of ESO and power required for a drive increases exponentially due to the mass being moved, due to the mass being moved <laughs> and the degree it is being lightened. Very massive ships or very high speed speeds are prohibitively expensive. In the field, if the field collapses while the ship is moving at FTL speed, the effects are catastrophic. The ship is snapped back to sublight velocity. The enormous excess energy shed in the form of lethal Cherenkov radiation. Okay, so you never want to stop while in the middle of an FTL uh, drive. <laughs> FTL drive the appearance. New Space Travelers asks, ask, what does it look like outside a ship moving at faster than light speed? Part of the answer can be seen in a simple pane of glass. Light travels, travels slower through glass than it does through open air. Also, light moves slower in conventional space than it does in a high-speed mass effect field. This causes refraction. Any light entering at an angle is bent and separated into a spectrum. Objects outside the ship will appear refracted. The greater the difference between the objective and subjective speeds of light are the greater the refraction. Okay. Ho ho ho, whoa, whoa, okay, it's a lot. As the subjective speed of light is raised within the field objects outside, sorry, as the subjective speed of light is raised within the field, objects outside will appear to redshift, eventually becoming visible only to radio telescope antennae. Uh, high energy electromagnetic sources normally hidden to the eye become visible in the high blue spectrum. As the speed of light continues to be raised, X-ray, gamma ray and eventually cosmic ray sources become visible. Stars with, uh, will be replaced by pulsars, the, accre the accretion disks of black holes, quasars and gamma ray bursts. The, to an outside observer, a ship within a mass effect drive envelope appears blue shifted. If within a field that allows travel at twice the speed of light, any radiation it emits has twice the energy as normal. If the ship is in a field of about 200 times light speed, it radiates visible light as X-rays and gamma rays, and the infrared heat from the hull is blue shifted up into the visible spectrum or higher. Ships moving at FTL speed are visible at great distances, though their signature will only propagate at the speed of light. Whoa. Okay, I hope you guys got that. <laughs> it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit hard to, to process this whole information, or at least that's how I think it. Even though it, it is explained quite well, you know, you have to. I think you. Ha I think I have to read it twice, so to say, just to to say, uh huh. Okay, I got it now. You know. Okay, let's move on to drive charge. As positive or negative electric current is passed through an FTL drive core, it acquires a static electrical charge. Drives can be operated an average of 50 hours before they reach charge saturation. This change is proportional to the magnitude of mass reduction. A heavier or faster ship requires saturation more quickly. If the charge is allowed to build, the core will discharge into the hull of the ship. All ungrounded crew members are fried to a crisp. An electronic, uh, all electronic systems are burned out, and metal bulkheads may be melted and fused together. The safest way to discharge a core is to land on a planet and establish a connection to the ground like a lightning rod. Larger vessels like dreadnoughts cannot land and must discharge into a planetary magnetic field. 
The ship passes the charge from the drive core to the exterior armored hull, then dives into the magnetic field. As the hull discharges, sheets of lightning jump away into the field, creating beautiful auroral displays on the planet. The ship must retract its sensors and weapons while dumping charge to prevent damage, leaking it blind and helpless. And helpless. Discharging at a moon with a weak magnetic field can take days. Discharging into the powerful field of a gas giant may require less than an hour. Deep space facilities, such as the Citadel, often have special discharge facilities for visiting ships. Cool. Combat Endurance Heat limits the strength and intensity of ship-to-ship combat. Starships generate enormous heat when they fire high-energy weapons, perform maneuvering burns, and run onboard combat electronics. In combat, warships can produce heat more quickly than they can disperse it. As heat, heat builds within a vessel, the crude spaces become increasingly uncomfortable. Before the heat reaches lethal levels, a ship must win or retreat by entering FTL. After an FTL run, the ship halts, shuts down non-essential systems, and activates the heat radiation gear. Combat endurance varies by ship design and by the battle location. Battles in the deep cold of inter- interstellar space can go on for some time. Engagements close to a star are brief. Since habitable worlds are usually close to a star, battles over them are frenetic. Are frantic, sorry, are frantic. Okay, general tactics. Shells lofted by surface navies crash back to Earth when their acceleration is overwhelmed by gravity and air resistance. In space, a projectile has unlimited range. It will keep moving until it hits something. Practical gunnery range is determined by the velocity of the attacker's ordnance and the maneuverability of the target. Beyond a certain range, a small ship's ability to dodge trumps a larger attacker's projectile speed. The longest range combat occurs between dreadnoughts, whose projectiles have the highest velocity but are the least maneuverable. The shortest range combat is between frigates which have the slowest projectile velocities and highest maneuverability. Opposing dreadnoughts with uh, open with a main gun artillery duel at extreme ranges of tens of thousands of kilometers. <laughs> Jesus. The fleets close, maintaining evasive lateral motion while keeping their bow guns facing the enemy. Fighters are launched and attempt to close the dis- to, uh, to close to disruptor torpedo range. Cautious admirals weaken the enemy with ranged fire and fighter strikes before committing to close action. Aggressive commanders advance advance so cruisers and frigates can engage. At long range, the main guns of cruisers become useful. Friendly interceptors engage enemy fighters until the attackers enter the range of ship-based guardian fire. Dreadnoughts fire from the rear, screened by smaller ships. Commanders must decide whether to commit to a general melee or retreat into FTL. At medium range, ships can be can use broadside guns. Fleets intermingle and it becomes difficult to retreat in order. Ships with damaged kinetic barriers are vulnerable to wolfpack frigate flotillas that speed through the battle space. Only fighters and frigates enter close knife fight. Ranges of a 10 Uh, or fewer kilometers. Fighters lose their disruptor torpedoes bringing down a ship's kinetic barriers and allowing it to be swarmed by frigates. Guardian lasers become viable weapons swatting down fighters and boiling away warship armor. Neither dreadnoughts nor cruisers can use their main guns at close range laying the bow on a moving target becomes impossible. Superheated thrust- thrusters exhaust becomes a hazard. Okay, that's a, that's a interesting inter- interesting tactics. Um, yeah, let's move on to planetary assaults. Planetary assaults are complicated if the target is a habitable garden world. The attackers cannot approach the defenders straight on. The Citadel conventions prohibit the use of large kinetic impactors against habitable worlds. In a straight-on attack, any missiles 
uh, any misses plow into the planet behind the defeat defending fleet. If the defenders position themselves between the attackers and the planet, they can fire at will while the attacker risks hitting the planet. <laughs> wow, okay. Successful assaults on a garden world uh, on garden worlds hinge upon up-to-date intelligence. Attackers need to determine where the enemy's defenses are, so they may approach from an angle that allows them to fire with no danger of collateral damage. Note, this is not necessarily for hostile worlds. Once control of orbit has been lost, defensive garrisons disperse into the wilderness. An enemy with orbital, orbital superiority can bombard surface forces with impunity. The best option for defenders is to hide and collect reconnaissance in anticipation to, of relief forces. Given the size of the planet, it is impractical to garrison entire conquered worlds. Fortunately, colonization efforts tend to focus on building up a dozen or fewer areas. Ground forces occupy the spaceports, industrial facilities, and major population centers. The wilderness is patrolled by unmanned aerial vehicles and satellite reconnaissance. If a defender unit is spotted, air mobile rapid deployment units and satellite artillery are used to pin down and destroy them. Okay. Trans relay assaults. The crucial choice of, for any attack through mass relays is how to divide the fleet for transit. The accuracy of a relay's mass projection depends on the mass being moved and how far it's going. How long, any long distance and or high mass jump will see drift. That is, a ship may be hundreds or millions of kilometers from its intended drop point in any direction from the relay. Distance can't be chosen by admirals, but a relay is told how much mass to transit. For example, if told to move a million metric tons of mass, the relay will scan the approach corridor, find four 250,000 ton fri freighters, and transit them together, maintaining their, ma their relative positions. A commander has the option of moving his fleet as one large coherent formation that may be wildly off position or breaking it into smaller formations that will be individually closer to the intended attack point but could be widely dispersed. Conservative assault doctrine holds that fleets should be moved en masse, maintaining concentration of force and reducing the chances of collision. The only time it is reasonable to split up a formation is during blockade running. It kind of makes sense. Uh, so basically, if you want to move a block, um, you know, a, a lot of ships at once, you can move them, but you might be very far from your destination point, so to say. And uh, it makes sense that you would want to keep the bulk of your um, the, the bulk of your army close together, let's say, even though you're far away from the target uh, when you when you get there, rather than than you know split them up in smaller chunks and then have them uh, being taken you know out one by one by the enemy. I guess right. It's like when you're standing in a doorway and you're waiting for uh, the enemies to come in and they come in one by one and you just shoot them one by one and you're just one guy <laughs> yeah it's like um, yeah like uh, the Spartans did yeah anyways um, let's move on to uh, the starships and we're gonna go through all the starships here so the first one is, is the carrier all races provide their fleets with organic fighter support Cruisers fit a handful of space between the interior pressure hulls and exterior armor. Dreadnoughts have a hangar deck with the hull. Humans who had only recently graduated from surface to space combat were the first to build ships wielding fighters as the main armament. In fleet combat, carriers stay clear of battle, launching fighters bearing disruptor torpedoes. Fighters are the primary striking power of the ship. If a carrier enters mass accelerator range of the enemy, things have gone very wrong. It is possible to recover and rearm fighters during combat, though most carriers seal the, fight, the flight deck and try to stay out of the way. 
The flight deck is essentially a corridor through the armor and into the heart of the vessel. A single well-placed torpedo is enough to gut a carrier. Alliance carriers are named after great leaders, artists, and intellectuals of human history. Moving on to crew considerations. Cabins give each individual 10 cubic meters of space. On larger vessels, private rooms are common. As ships get smaller, the number of crew packed into a single wardroom increases. Asari prefer shared spaces, even on large vessels, while Krogan territorial instincts make it impossible for them to cohabitate even on the smallest ships. On smaller vessels, hot bunking is the norm. <clears throat> crew, member, crew members assigned to different watches share the same bunk. When one gets off duty, he wakes up the person in the bunk. While, uh, th- while that crewman is on duty, the first gets his rank, his rack time. Sorry. Yeah, that's, uh, that's okay. That's the way I think, uh, that's the way it functions uh, nowadays uh, as well on, on, like, on submarines or stuff like that. Spacecraft compartments can be isolated by airtight doors in case of decompression. The cinematic vision of explosive decompression is fiction. Hold compartments either take enough damage that occupants are killed instantly or leak slowly enough that they are able to reach protective gear. Compartments are equipped with emergency life support apparatus, life-proof plastic bubbles with air bottles. Small when stowed, Elsa comfortably accommodates one individual when inflated. Damage control procedure cuts off ventilation to burning compartments without oxygen to consume fire dies in seconds. The compartment is repressurized afterwards for crew recovery. Mass effect fields create an artificial gravity or agrav plane below the decks, preventing muscle atrophy and bone loss in zero G. Large vessels arrange their decks perpendicular to their thrust axis. The highest decks are at the bow and the lowest at the engines. This allows a grav to work with the inertial efforts of thrust. Ships that can land arrange their decks laterally, so the crew can move about while the vessel is on the ground. Warships normally turn off the, their agrav systems during combat, reducing the heat generated by systems and increasing combat endurance. To provide a point of reference for navigation in zero g, floors are painted a different color from the walls and ceilings. Nah, that makes sense. Okay, moving on to the cruisers. Cruiser weight starships are the standard combat unit encountered away from large naval uh, bases, the poor bloody infantry of most fleets. Nimble scouting frigates have neither the punch nor the stamina to stand up to serious combat and the mighty dreadnoughts are a strategic resource carefully hoarded and committed to the most critical battles. Cruisers perform routine, independent, show-the-flag patrols in settled systems and lead flotillas of frigates in small engagements, such as pirate suppression campaigns. In major fleet engagements, cruiser squadrons support the dreadnought battle line by screening their flanks against enemies attempting to maneuver for a main gun bowshot from their vulnerable broadsides. Alliance cruisers are named after cities of Earth. Starships fighters, fighters, sorry. Fighters are single pilot combat small aircraft. They are lightweight enough that they can be economically fitted with powerful element zero cores, making them capable of greater acceleration and sharper maneuvers than starships. Kinetic barrier shields changed starship battles from short, vicious bloodbaths to extended, indecisive slugging matches. Only the main gun of a dreadnought could punch a mass accelerator slug through the barriers of an opposing dreadnought. This changed with the development of the fighter-launched mass disruptor torpedo, a short-ranged weapon that can penetrate kinetic barriers to destroy their projector assemblies. Starship Guardian defenses must be over, uh, overwhelmed through swarm tactics. Fighter groups can take heavy casualties, pressing their torpedo attacks home. Once fighter-launched torpedoes have crippled an enemy's barrier, the mass accelerators on frigates and couriers can make short work of them. Uh, 
Interceptors are a type of fighter optimized to attack other fighters with no ability to damage starships. Interceptors are used to screen friendly units from incoming fighter attack. Cool. Heat management. Dispersal of heat generated by onboard systems is a critical issue for a starship. For a ship. <laughs> or a starship. If it cannot deal with heat, the crew may be cooked within the hull. Radiation is the only way to shed heat in a vacuum. Civilian vessels utilize large, fragile uh, radiator, radiator panels that are impossible to armor. Warships use diffuse radiator arrays, or DRAs, ceramic strips along the exterior of the armored hull. These make the ship appear stripped to thermographic sensors. Since the arrangement of the strips depends on the internal configuration of the ship, the patterns of each vessel are unique and striking. On older ships, the DRA strips could become red or white hot. Dubbed tiger stripes or war paint by humans, the glowing DRA had a physical, physiological impact on pirates and irregular forces. Strip radiators are not as efficient as panels, but if damaged by enemy fire, the ship only loses a small portion of its total radi radiation capacity. In most cases, a vessel's DRA alone allows it to cruise with no difficulties. Operations deep within a solar system can, co can cause problems. A ship engaged in, a combat, uh, in combat can produce titanic amounts of heat from maneuvering burns and weapon fire. When fighting in a high heat environment, warships employ <clears throat> high efficiency droplet heat sinks. In a droplet system, tanks of liquid sodium or lithium absorb heat within the ship. The liquid is vented from spray nozzles near the bow as a thin sheet of millions of micrometer scale droplets. The droplets are caught at the stern and recycled into the system. A droplet system can sink 10 to 100 times as much heat as DRA strips. Droplet sheets resemble the surface a surface ships may wake through the water. The wake peels out in sharp turns, spreading a fan of droplets as the ship changes vectors and leaves the coolant behind. Starship's sensors. Light lag prevents sensing in real time at great distances. A ship firing its thrusters at the Charon relay can be easily detected from Earth 5.75 light hours or 6 billion kilometers away. But Earth will only see the event 5 hours and 45 minutes after it, it occurs. Due to the light speed limit, defenders can't see enemies coming until they have already arrived. Because there is FTL traveling communications but no FTL sensors, frigates are crucial for scouting and picket duties. Passive sensors are used for long-range detection, while active sensors obtain short-range, high-quality targeting data. Passive sensors include visual, thermo thermographic, and radio detectors that watch and listen for objects in space. A powered ship emits a great deal of radiation, given off by power plants... Uh, sorry... Uh, I lost. I lost my. Uh, what, 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 what? So passive sensors include vital visual thermographic and radio detectors that watch and listen for objects in space. A powered ship emits a great deal of uh, energy. The heat of the life support systems, the radiation given off by power plants and electrical equipment, and the exhaust of the thrusters. Starships stand out plainly against the near absolute zero background of space. Passive sensors can be used during FTL travel, but incoming data is significantly distorted by the effects of the mass effect envelope and Doppler shift. Active sensors are radars and high resolution LADARs, or laser detection and ranging, that emit a ping of energy and listen for return signals. LADARs have a narrower field of view than a radar, but LADAR resolution allows images of detected objects to be assembled. Active sensors are useless when a ship is moving at FTL speeds. Moving on to thrusters. A mass effect drive core decreases the mass of a bubble of space-time around the ship. This gives the ship the potential to move quickly, but does not apply any motive power. 
ships use their sublight thrusters for motive power and FTL. There are several ver varieties of thruster varying in performance versus economy. All ships are required with a ray are equipped sorry with arrays of hydrogen oxygen reaction control thrusters for maneuvering. Ion drives electrically accelerate charged particles as a re reaction mass. They are extremely efficient but produce negligible thrust. They are mainly used for automated cargo barges. The primary commercial engine is a fusion torch which vents the plasma of the ship's power plant. Fusion torches are often powerful acceleration at the cost of... Sorry, fusion torches offer powerful acceleration at the cost of dif difficult heat management. Torch fuel is fairly cheap. Helium-3 skimmed from gas giants and uh, deuterium extracted from seawater or cometary bodies. Propellant is hydrogen, likewise skimmed from gas giants. In combat, military vessels require accelerations beyond the capability of fusion torches. Warship thrusters inject antiprotons into a reaction chamber filled with hydrogen. The matter-antimatter -matter annihilation provides unmatched motive power. The drawback is fuel production. Antiprotons must be manufactured one particle at a time. Most antimatter production is done at massive solar arrays orbiting energetic stars, making them high-value targets in wartime. The exhaust of fusion and, and, and antiproton drives is measured in millions of degrees Celsius. Any vessel caught behind them will melt like wax in a blowtorch. Wow. Any long-duration inter interstellar flight consists of two phases, acceleration and deceleration. Starships accelerate to the halfway point of their journey, then flip 180 degrees and apply thrust to the opposite vector, decelerating as they finish the trip. The engines are always operating and peak speed is attained at the middle of the flight. Okay, moving on to weapons ablative armor. I think this is new. A warship's kinetic barriers reduce the damage from solid objects, but cannot, can do nothing to block guardian lasers, particle beams, and other forms of directed energy weapons, or DEW. The inner layer of a warship protection consists of ablative armor plate designed to boil away when heated. The vaporized armor material scatters a dew beam, rendering it ineffectual. A scaffold is built around the interior pressure hull with sheets of ablative armor hung from the structure. Ships typically have multiple layers of armor separated by empty baffles, spaces often used for cargo storage. Cruisers, which lack the internal space to fit dedicated fighter hangars, store the shipboard fighter complement in the baffles. It is not unknown for enlisted crew to build illicit alcohol distilleries in some obscure corner of the baffles, safe from prying eyes. Of course, why not? You know, you need alcohol, come on. You're in space, you know, if you're in a battle, you need to get some whiskey in you or something like that, or something similar, something strong to give you, <laughs> to give you the, the power you need or the insanity that you, <laughs> that you need in those moments. Okay, moving on to the Guardian. A ship's general area defense integration anti-spacecraft network, wow, or Guardian, <laughs> consists of anti-missile, anti-fighter laser turrets on the exterior hull. Because these are under computer control, the gunnery control officer needs to do little beyond turn the systems on and designates targets as hostile. Since lasers move at light speed, they cannot be dodged by anything moving at non-relativistic speeds. Unless the beam is aimed poorly, it will always hit its target. In the early stages of a battle, the Guardian fire uh, is 100% accurate. It is not 100% lethal, but it doesn't have to be. Damaged fighters, damaged fighters must break off for repairs. Lasers are limited by diffraction. The beam spreads out, decreasing the energy density, watts per uh, square meter. The weapon can uh, place on a target. Any high-powered laser is a short-ranged weapon. Guardian networks have another limitation, heat. 
Weapons grade lasers require cooldown time, during which heat is transferred to sinks or radiators. As lasers fire, heat builds within them, reducing damage, range and accuracy. Fighters attack in swarms. The first few will be hit, hit by a guardian. But as battle continues, the effects of laser overheat allow the attackers to press even closer to the ship. Constant use will burn out a laser. Guardian lasers typically operate in infrared frequencies. Shorter frequencies would offer superior stopping power and range, but degradation of focal arrays and mirrors would make them expensive to maintain and most prefer mechanical reliability over bleeding edge performance where lives are concerned. Solarians, however, use near ultraviolet frequency lasers with six times the range, believing that having additional time to shoot down incoming missiles is more important. Lasers are not blocked by the kinetic barriers of capital ships. However, the range of lasers limits their use to rare knife fight range ship to ship combat. Cool. So now we know more about ships and vehicles. So, I think we're going to just go ahead and uh, read through the um, the technology and I'm going to leave uh, weapons, armor and equipment. Um, I, I've already read that, that one, so um, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and move on to technology now and go through this because it is a lot to go through <laughs> already. And I'm sure uh, there's going to be a bunch of videos on the codex here and uh, yeah going to be a lot of information for you guys and for me as well because like you've seen there is some new information uh, intertwined here with some old information so moving on to technology and biotics and biotic amps biotics manipulate mass effect fields using dozens of element zero nodules within their nervous systems that react to electri electric stimuli from the brain Amplifiers allow biotics to synchronize the nodules so they can form fields large and strong enough for practical use. Amplifiers can improve the specific discipline or talent. An implant is a surgically embedded interface port into which amps are plugged in. On humans, the implant is usually placed at the base of the skull for convenient access, though the user must be careful to keep it free of contaminants. Implant ports can fit a variety of amps, and there is a growing market for modifications in the uh, and add-ons. The finest quality implants and amps are manufactured by Asari artisans, but the Alliance's L3 implants, first deployed in 2170, are a significant step forward. Okay, so this is basically the same information that we had in um, Mass Effect 1. Life as a Biotic Biotics possess extraordinary abilities, but they must live with minor inconveniences. The most obvious issue is getting adequate nutrition. Creating biotic mass effects takes such a toll on metabolism that active biotics develop ravenous appetites. The standard alliance combat ration for soldier is 3000 calories per day. Biotics are given 4,500, 4, as well as a canteen of potent energy drink for quick refreshment after hard combat. Just a, just a little bit of a, <laughs> of a side note here. Um, it's, uh, th this, this whole thing here is very similar to um, how mages function in, uh, in the World of Warcraft uh, universe, or in the Warcraft universe, sorry. Uh, in the Warcraft universe, mages need to eat a lot and, and, and gain a lot of nutrients because um, using magic uh, takes a toll on them, so <laughs> they eat, eat a lot. Uh, anyways, that was just me sidetracking a little bit. Let's get back here. Another ish issue is electric charge. Electricity accumulated in starship drive cores must be discharged, and uh, so must the electricity in a biotic user. Biotics are prone to small static discharges when they touch metal. Hmm, interesting. Unfortunately, human biotics also face suspicion and prosecution, being uh, beginning with the popular misconception that they can read and control minds. Biotics symbolize the dehumanization of mankind to people philosoph philosophically and religiously opposed to gene modification and cybernetics. Militaries are the only organizations that allow that always welcome biotics, offering them huge recruitment incentives. Yeah, uh, training. 
Biotic implants and amplifiers only provide the potential to create coherent mass effect fields. Whether biotics can actually do so is largely determined by their training. Biotics must develop conscious control over their nervous systems, sending specific electrical impulses to the element zero nodules embedded in their nerves. They are taught to use their implants and amps with biofeedback devices and physical mnemonics. Specific gestures or muscle movements fire the proper sequence of nerves to activate a certain skill. Kinetics Industries pioneered biotic training with the Biotic Acclimation and Temperance Training Program. Although BAT, um, or BAT, did not achieve the desired results, many techniques taught are still used today. Many human think tanks are trying to develop some forms of biotic super soldier. Most are benign efforts to create more flexible troops. Others, less publicly known and unapologetic, are unapologetic attempts to create Nietzschean supermen. <laughs> okay, of course, there has to be some crazy dude that wants to develop the superhuman, right? Um, communications. The real-time communication is possible thanks to networks of extensive or expansive mass relay com- combuies that can daisy-chain a transmission via lasers. Com buoys are maintained in patterns built outward from each mass relay. The buoys are little more than a cluster of primitive miniature mass relays. Each individual buoy is connected to a partner on another buoy in the network, (laughs) forming a corridor of low mass space. Tight beam communications Lasers are piped through these tubes of FTL space, allowing virtually instantaneous communication to anywhere on the network. The networks connect across regions by communications lasers through the mass relays. With the system, the only communications delay is the light lag between the source or destination and the closest buoy. So long as all parties remain within half a light second or 150,000 kilometers of buoys, seamless real-time communications are possible. Since buoys are maintained in all traveled areas, most enjoy unlimited instant communication. Ships only suffer communications lag when operating off-established deep space routes around uninhabited outer system gas giants and other unsettled areas. During wartime, however, Kambui networks are the first target of attack. Once the network is severed, it can take anywhere from weeks to years to get a message out of, um, sorry, out of a contested system. In systems where a buoy network has not yet been built or has been destroyed, rapid communication means ferrying information through high-speed courier ships and unmanned data drones. Communications Administration While combuies allow rapid transmission, there is a finite amount of bandwidth available. Given that trillions of people may be trying to pass a message through a given buoy at any time, access to the network is parceled out on priority tiers. Again, this is the same information that we got in Mass Effect 1. The Citadel Council and the Spectres have absolute priority. If they are using all the bandwidth, everyone else must wait. Individual governments and their militaries enjoy the next highest tier. During wartime, civilian communication can suffer hours or even days of lag. Intelligence agencies study ping time through various systems to predict military buildups. Below the governments and militaries, bandwidth priority is sold to the highest bidder. Media conglomerates, particularly headline news networks, purchase higher priority to provide their viewers with timely information. Corporations that require timely information and response capability, for example financial institutions and investment firms, also invest heavily in priority access. The funds acquired through sales of bandwidth are used to maintain and expand the communications infrastructure. While everyone with a computer has guaranteed free and unlimited access to the galactic extranet, they are last in line for bandwidth and may have to wait for their request to be processed. 
bandwidth resale corporations use investment capital to purchase blacks of high priority access made available by paid subscription. The, method the methodology of communication. As the population of the galaxy increases and new worlds are settled, timely access for home users and frontier settlements with underdeveloped, underdeveloped communication infrastructures is, growing, is a growing problem. To ameliorate bandwidth issues, a sophisticated array of data caches and virtual intelligence search agent programs are available. When a user submits a query, it is first routed to the data cache on their colony or star system. At the cache, the user's search agent VI collates mountains of locally stored data to find the desired material. If the information is not available locally, the query is passed along to neighboring systems and then outward in an expanding network. VI search engines in those systems replicate the search. If the desired information is found, it is compressed into a burst file and queued for transmission to the source system. The burst is assigned a priority based on the number of queries for it. The greater the number of queries, the higher the priority. When a new solar system is first connected to the net, a selection of the most popular data is installed locally. Though storage hardware is cheap, the capacity required to hold all the data produced every day by trillions of people on hundreds of worlds is not trivial. It's not economical to store local copies of all the data available on obscure topics, just in case. As colonies mature, older and less populated chunks of data filter into them as a result of queries and are placed in the local archive. Searches for obscure topics are increasingly likely to produce instant results as the archive grows. Cool. Moving on to artificial intelligence. An artificial intelligence is a self-aware computing system capable of learning and independent decision making. Creation of a con uh, conscious AI requires adaptive code, a slow expensive education and a specialized quantum computer called a blue box. An AI cannot be transmitted across a communication channel or computer network. Without its blue box, an AI is no more than data files. Loading these files into a new blue box will create a new personality as variations of the quantum hardware and routine runtime results create unpredictable variations. The geth serve as a cautionary tale against the dangers of rogue AI, and in Citadel space they are technically illegal. Advocacy groups argue, however, that an AI is a living, conscious entity deserving the same rights as organics. They argue that continued use of the term artificial is institutionalized racism on the part of organic life. The term synthetic is considered the politically con uh, correct alternative. Cool. Virtual Intelligence a virtual intelligence is an advanced form of user interface software. VIs use a variety of methods to stimulate natural converse conversation, including an audio interface and an avatar personality to interact with. Although a VI can provide a convicting, convincing sorry, emulation of sentience, they are not self-aware, nor they can learn or take independent action. VIs are used as operating systems on commercial and home computers. Minimal VI agents are also available. Agents are compact and specialized. Some serve as personal secretaries, filtering calls and scheduling meetings based on user-defined priorities. Others are advanced search engines, propagating themselves across the extranet to collate user-requested data. Commercial VIs in a variety of stock personalities are available at any software retailer. Boutique firms and hobbyists also build unique VIs to personal specification. Although software emulation of living personalities is illegal, reconstructions of famous historical figures are common. Credits or creds. The standard credit was established by the Citadel's Unified Banking Act as the currency of interstellar trade. The credit has a managed floating exchange rate calculated in real time by the central bank to maintain the average value of all participating currencies. Some regional currencies are worth more than a credit, and some less. Hard currency can be stolen or counterfeited, so electronic fund transfers are the norm. More importantly, physical transactions cannot be easily tracked, making them ideal for tax evasion or the purchase of illegal, illegal goods. 
When the alliance joined the Citadel, its various national treasures were linked into the credit network. A human with a bank account of Mexican pesos, Japanese yen or Indian rupees can purchase any item priced in credits at fair market value. All ec economies that participate in the credit network are required to price items in both local currency and credits. And last but not least, drones. Drones are small robots used to support and supplement organic soldiers on the battlefield. <clears throat> they have no artificial intelligence of any kind but follow fixed, minimally adaptive programs. Most varieties employ mass effect levitation to improve mobility. All modern armies rely on uh, veritable fleets of drones for routine soldiering, static, uh, garrisons, patrols, etc. The use of drones as non-critical duties keeps a manpower needs down and reduces the casualties in low-intensity conflicts. Um, less advanced races and cultural and cultures with less sensitivity to casualties have correspondingly fewer drones in their inventory. Drones are of little use in conventional open field battles as they are poorly armed and armored. In addition to combat drones, support drones are used to assist organic units in the field. Reconnaissance drones are small stealthy craft that screen combat units in the field and warm, warn commanders when enemies are spotted. Electronic warfare drones supplement battlefield technicians serving as mobile jammers and elint. Electronic intelligence gathering platforms, military and civilian police utilize da Dazzler drones equipped with powerful strobe lights to disorient and subdue intruders using non-lethal force. Drone formations are officially referred to as wings. Uh, deploy the fourth assault drone wing on the left flank. Okay. Common soldiers often refer to fl friendly formations as flocks and enemy formations as swarms. Whew. Okay, guys. Well, I think we're done with, uh, with the codex for now. Um... In the weapons and uh, armor and equipment, uh, we're basically going to find out mostly about the body armor, kinetic barriers, mass accelerators, and small arms, which is, uh, yeah, a lot, of a lot of this information is basically from the first game anyway. So, yeah. Um, I hope you enjoyed these videos. Um, at, at the point of, at this time when I'm recording this, I don't know how many, how many chunks I will uh, split this whole thing into, but I don't really want to put uh, a two hour video um, <laughs> on the internet, so I might just split it into, I don't know, 30 minute chunks or 25 minute chunks. I'll have to see. Um, in case, I, I, I mean, not in case, I hope you enjoyed this, these videos. I hope you find them um, uh, useful. Uh, I certainly find uh, the information useful because for me, it's just, <clears throat> it, um, it, it, it makes me remember some stuff and also it makes me understand a bunch of other stuff. And the, I like the fact that there's some new information in here. So I'm going to cut this episode here for now and we can get back to the action, right? Because now we went through all the codex entries and... Um, I don't know. I'm gonna. I'm going to try to be very careful with the codex this time around. As you can see here, I have a marked uh, all viewed uh, button, which I'm going to avoid pressing. And uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to look into if there's any key binding that uh, marks everything as red and just disable it. Okay, guys. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give a like. Please um, also uh, follow the series and let me know what you think in the comment section of the, of the videos. And uh, I will see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.